signs of improvement. President Donald Trump appears to be improving after being taken to the hospital with COVID-19. We have the latest. Supreme Court battle. Several Republican senators test positive for the coronavirus. How it may affect the timetable on hearings for Judge Amy Coney Barrett. A new encyclical. Pope Francis signs a new encyclical inspired by St. Francis of Assisi. We have a report and reaction. And message to Turkey. A Greek Orthodox archdiocese is asking the United Nations to step in after Istanbul converted an ancient Orthodox cathedral into a mosque. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, October 5th, 2020. Supporters cheer as President Donald Trump's motorcade pays them a surprise visit at Walter Reed Medical Center outside of the nation's capital yesterday. The president arrived there on Friday after having been diagnosed with coronavirus. Soon after, people began gathering outside to show their support. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Donald Trump plans to leave the hospital tonight. He says that he is feeling really good despite his COVID-19 infection and he encourages others not to be afraid of the disease or to let it dominate their life. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. At the White House, another case of COVID-19. White House Press Secretary Kelly McEnany says she tested positive for the first time today. McEnany released a statement on Twitter saying she's experiencing no symptoms and will begin the quarantine process and will continue working. Meanwhile, on a video on his Twitter page Sunday, President Donald Trump praised the staff at Walter Reed. The work they do is just absolutely amazing, and I want to thank them all, the nurses, the doctors, everybody here. He says he's learned a lot about COVID-19. I learned it by really going to school. This is the real school. This isn't the let's read the book school, and I get it, and I understand it. And with Election Day drawing near, he also talked about enthusiasm. And we have enthusiasm like probably nobody's ever had. Our people that love the job we're doing, we have more enthusiasm than maybe anybody. The president did more campaigning on Twitter Monday as well, writing religious liberty, vote, and pro-life, vote. With November 3rd quickly approaching, the upcoming debates loom large. Vice President Mike Pence and Democratic Vice Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris square off in Salt Lake City this Wednesday in their one and only debate. Also, Democratic Presidential Candidate Joe Biden continues to campaign. Whether President Trump and Joe Biden debate next week, as scheduled, remains to be seen. On Sunday, in a move criticized by some, the president got in his motorcade to salute supporters outside. The White House says it was cleared by his medical team. And this morning, his wife, First Lady Melania Trump, tweeted, My family is grateful for all the prayers and support. I am feeling good and will continue to rest at home. Thank you to medical staff and caretakers everywhere. And my continued prayers for those who are ill or have a family member impacted by the virus. Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. The head of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops joins those who are praying for the president and the first lady. In a statement over the weekend, Archbishop Jose Gomez said in part, quote, may God grant them full healing and may he keep their families safe and healthy. The head of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles also asked God to bring an end to the pandemic. Two GOP members of the Senate Judiciary Committee have tested positive for COVID-19, and that is leading some people to question the timing of the Supreme Court confirmation hearings for Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric? Well, Tracy, because of those outbreaks, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has decided to suspend all activity on the Senate floor for at least the next two weeks. And I did speak with Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham, who says that this will have no effect on the timeline of Judge Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation hearing, despite Democrats' objections. If this were a baseball team or a football team, three of the players tested positive for COVID-19, any responsible, caring manager would say enough. A member of the Judiciary Committee, Democratic Senator Dick Durbin, says Majority Leader Mitch McConnell should put the full work of the Senate on pause. 
while its members recover from COVID-19. And Minority Leader Chuck Schumer agrees. Mitch McConnell seems to be jamming through the hearings on Amy Coney Barrett, even though three senators have COVID, even though he has said it's not safe for the Senate to meet in session. But Leader McConnell's decision to pause Senate floor activity until October 19th may be more about which three senators have recently announced they have COVID-19. Senators Ron Johnson, Tom Tillis, and Mike Lee, all three Republicans, with those three in isolation as they recover, the GOP slim Senate majority would be in trouble when it came to any votes. Leader McConnell stated on Saturday, quote, the Senate floor schedule will not be interrupted. The confirmation process previously laid out by Chairman Graham. Amy Barrett's going on the court. Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham issued his own statement Saturday announcing, quote, no change to Senate Judiciary Committee Supreme Court nomination hearing set to begin on October 12th. For Judiciary, we will be basing our decision based upon her qualifications and her character. Judiciary Committee has held more than a dozen virtual meetings, but uh, so far they have not voted uh, virtually because they can't. They have to actually have to hear, be here present in order to vote. So that is why Leader McConnell has advised his Republican colleagues that they have to return back to Washington, D.C. by October 19th for a vote. Tracy. Correspondent Eric Rosales reporting from Capitol Hill for us tonight. Thank you so much, Eric. Pope Francis says unity and putting others first will help heal a world full of divisions and still fighting the coronavirus pandemic. The Holy Father says the encyclical in Assisi, while there he celebrated Mass and visited the tomb of St. Francis of Assisi. The letter is called Fratelli Tutti. Translated, it means all brothers. EWTN News Rome correspondent Colin Flynn joins us now with more. Colin, so good to see you. So this is the Pope's third encyclical. What can you tell us about Fratelli Tutti? Good evening, Tracy. Well, there's a lot in this 200-page document, but here's some of the key takeaways. At the very start of the document, Pope Francis talks about a wounded world. He cites poverty, war, persecution, and the plight of migrants. This encyclical is him laying out the way he thinks, working together, the world can try and heal. And this is where he calls for fraternity and social friendship, that shared responsibility we have for one another, to be brothers and sisters, and not just Catholics, but this is to people of all faiths and to people who have no faith at all. Now, core to the document, he dedicates an entire chapter to this, is the parable of the Good Samaritan, who stops and gives of his time to a beggar. Pope Francis reminds us of this story, asking us to remember the dignity of every human and that the most valuable thing we can give to another is our time. I know the Pope also spoke about global politics and capitalism. What more can you tell us about that? Well, as a social encyclical, this document touches on all aspects of political, social and economic life. He gives the coronavirus pandemic as an example of how he feels the political system and societal structure in many parts of the world has failed those who need it the most. And he warns that as a people, we can come out of this pandemic worse off or better off than we went into it. He calls into question, as he puts it, the magic theories of capitalism, which he claims have been seen to fail, and that the world needs politics of love. In Chapter 7, he discusses the conditions for peace and reconciliation, deploring the injustices of war, saying that there should never, ever be a reason for a just war, and calling for an end to the use of the death penalty worldwide. He also emphasized again that the death penalty is inadmissible, recalling the 2018 update to the Catechism's teaching on that very topic. And yesterday, at the press conference for Fratelli Tutti at the Vatican, I spoke to Cardinal Michael Cherney and asked him if he thought this document in parts painted a bleak picture of the Western world today. Can you find me somebody who says that the world is better than it's painted in the, in the encyclical? Can you find somebody who will say, honestly, this is, no, this is, it's not like this. People really are much better off and much happier and much more secure and their dignity is much more, no. It's a, it's, unfortunately, it's a realistic picture. 
Oh, Colin, one of the other strong points of the encyclical is the Pope's teachings on borders. What exactly did he have to say about that? Well, Tracy, the Pope speaks very clearly about the rights that everyone in the world has to, as he puts it, the goods of the planet, and that no one should be denied these goods if they need them for their survival. And even if that means having to access or travel to another territory, meaning another country. So to get some insight on this, after the conference, I spoke with a political theologian from the UK who was one of the speakers at the Vatican press conference, Professor Anna Rollins. He's very clear that the church is an open borders community. He's also very clear that borders of a nation state may exist for a reason of preserving the common good. However, they are never, ever primary. They always have to admit of a duty to provide hospitality, gift exchange and cultural exchange. And Tracy, in the encyclical's conclusion, Pope Francis said that the text was inspired not only by St. Francis, but also by non-Catholics such as Martin Luther King Jr., Desmond Tutu, and Mahatma Gandhi, as well as the French Catholic missionary, Blessed Charles de Foucault, who the Pope is expected to canonize. All right. Well, Colin, thank you so much for that report. We appreciate it. Colin Flynn, EWTN News Rome correspondent. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Tracy. To discuss more about Fratelli Tutti is Dr. Andrew Abella, the Dean of the School of Business and Economics and Associate Professor of Marketing at the Catholic University of America. Dr. Abella, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Pope Francis writes in this encyclical, by acknowledging the dignity of each human person, we can contribute to the rebirth of a universal aspiration to fraternity. Why does he have such a sense of urgency about this message right now? I think it's to the point that Cardinal Charlie made about th things are just not very good in the world today. I think the fundamental message of the encyclical is, unless we return to God, none of this is going to get any better. So it's 43,000 words. I think if you sum it all up, that, that's his main point. Um, in the first part of the encyclical, the Pope addresses the many challenges and the crisis that we're facing right now in the world. But then he reflects on the parable of the Good Samaritan. What do you think that parable teaches us as far as building a more just and fraternal world? I think it's a reflection on our duty to the other, to, to, to treat others as, as brothers. Uh, it, it's, there was a, a famous experiment at Princeton some years ago where they, they told a bunch of students that you're going to give a lecture on the Good Samaritan and hurry up and get to such and such a building. And then in an alleyway on the way, they planted an actor who was pretending to be suffering and in need of medical attention. More than half of the people giving this lecture literally stepped over the actor so they wouldn't be late to give their uh, talk about the Good Samaritan. We can't do that as Christians. We really have to take this stuff seriously, I think is his point. Um, can we talk about what this encyclical means for someone who is maybe in business? And is there any change in church teaching in the document regarding business as well as economics? So there's no change here. What he's doing is reiterating the teachings of the many previous popes before him who have written on the social doctrine. These are challenging teachings, uh, but you can sum them up, and this is what we teach at the, at the Bush School of Business to our students, that business is a form of service to others. You're serving your customers by giving them good, you know, making good things, uh, providing good services. You're serving your employees by providing opportunity for work. It includes challenging things like what's called the universal destination of goods or the common destination of created goods which is a teaching of the church that goes all the way back to even St. Thomas Aquinas, where St. Thomas said that you, you can think about the way we own things in two ways. From the perspective of ownership, the thing is mine. I decide how to dispose of it, when to sell it, if I want to sell it, to whom, and so on. But in terms of the use of a good, we should think about our stuff as, as how to serve others. So that, that the reason we have stuff is in order to serve others. And then Pope Pius XI, who had clarified that point and said, we, we serve others in, with our things in two ways. One is when we give away to those who need, and the other is when we invest what we have so that others can have an opportunity to work. I think this is a really important point. It says that private property isn't kind of just for me to do with what I want. It's for me to, to basically work out my own salvation by using it for the good of others. It doesn't mean it should all be taken away from me. That would completely violate the idea. But it says this is the purpose of, of having goods, is to serve others. Well, Dr. Andrew Abella, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you coming on the show. My pleasure. Coming up. 
How Christians are responding after Turkey's president turned a longtime Greek Orthodox cathedral and museum into a mosque. The Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America is petitioning United Nations experts to hold Turkey accountable for its, quote, deliberate policies to erase the cultural heritage of Orthodox Christians. The rebuke follows Turkish President Recep Erdogan's reconversion of Istanbul's landmark Hagia Sophia from a museum into a mosque in July. The structure, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, had served as one of Christendom's most important cathedrals and a mosque for centuries as well as a museum for 86 years. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about this is Richard Gazelle, Senior Advisor for In Defense of Christians. Rich, thanks so much for being here. Great to see you again. So tell us, Excuse why her. is it so important for the international community to keep up the pressure on Turkey to reverse its decision on the Hagia Sophia? Well, indeed, it's very important. Um, the world must send a crystal clear message to Turkey that uh, historic sites, let alone world heritage sites, are not to be uh, regarded as spoils of war. And more importantly, Turkey's Christian community uh, shouldn't be considered a conquered people. And that's exactly what Erdogan, Erdogan seeks to do. Rich, what are some of your concerns about what this conversion signals for Christians? Well, one thing we need to understand about Erdogan, first off, is that he is an Islamist. He's a neo-Ottoman. Uh, he seeks to resurrect the Ottoman Empire and he wants to stop at nothing to do so. Um, if the remaining Christians of Turkey stand in his way, so be it. He's willing to run them right over uh, in achieving his goal to resurrect the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. Uh, Turkey's, the Turkish Christian community today are acutely aware of what's going on and the fact that they are being used um, as a pawn of Erdogan, and that concerns them greatly. Rich, can you talk about what this does to the Christian cultural legacy in Turkey? And also, I'm curious, what are you and your group hearing from Christians in Turkey right now? Well, as I said, Christians in Turkey are unfortunately aware of what's going on there, of what Erdogan's government seeks to do. They realize that this is a message from the government to the people that you are a conquered people. Uh, and look, this isn't merely um, a, a one-time incident. This is just the latest event uh, in a series of events that uh, constitutes a long history of such actions against the Christians of Turkey. Um, there, there are very few left. You know, about a century ago, they constituted 20 percent of the country. Today, they're a fraction of a percent um, of Turkey and dwindling, unfortunately. Um, how is Turkey's persecution of Christians, how is it extended beyond its borders? Well, as, as, you, uh, as you correctly said, it, it does extend uh, beyond its borders. Currently, Turkey's tentacles extend uh, throughout the, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Middle East, and into the Caucasus. Turkey currently has jihadists in Iraq and in Syria seeking to uh, uh, disrupt uh, whatever semblance of stability there is there. And of course, the, the largest price is paid by the Christians. As of last week, Turkey is also sending jihadists on the payroll, mind you, Turkey's payroll, into Artsakh, which is uh, part of Armenia, um, occupied almost entirely by Christian Armenians. Um, they, they seek to expel the remaining Christians from that region. Uh, so this is, again, nothing new for Turkey. This is uh, part of a long history of what Turkey seeks to do in the region to expand their hegemony and uh, essentially direct and influence the Islamic world. Rich, I'm curious, uh, what are some of the political measures that you'd like to see taken against Turkey's government? Yes, uh, certainly uh, IDC has thus far called for a boycott along with our partner organizations of all Turkish products, uh, tourism in Turkey, as well as use of Turkish airlines, which is in part owned by the government of Turkey. In addition to that, we urge um, the uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom to designate Turkey as a country of particular concern. This would be the first step in, uh, in issuing sanctions uh, over Turkey. Uh, one thing, as I said before, we need to understand about Erdogan is he doesn't take well to uh, kindly asking him to, uh, to do things or to respect religious minorities. He only understands one language, and that's strength. We know right now Erdogan is uh, presiding over a suffering economy. His poll numbers are dropping uh, precipitously, and sanctions will essentially be icing on the cake to get him to do uh, exactly what the world uh, community expects him to do uh, in respecting his Christian minorities uh, within his borders. 
Well, Rich Gazelle, thank you so much for your time, Senior Advisor for In Defense of Christians. Thanks again, Rich. Great to be with you, Tracy. Up next, the Vatican welcomes the newest members of the group that protects the Pope. We'll explain. Bishop Michael Burbage of the Diocese of Arlington has announced the creation of an advisory council to address racism and its harmful impact on communities and individuals within the diocese. Bishop Michael F. Burbage of the Diocese of Arlington joins me now on Skype. Your Excellency, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you, Tracy. Good to be with you and your audience. Well, Your Excellency, tell us your goals for this advisory council on racism and how do you hope clergy and lay people can work together on this issue? Well, you know, the bishops of the country uh, in 2018 offered, uh, issued a pastoral letter against racism, racism, open wide our hearts. And so part of the advisory uh, council, uh, Tracy will be helping me to understand how we in this local church in this diocese have responded uh, to that pastoral letter, how we have implemented uh, building upon what we have been doing, we've been having listening sessions and conferences and learning a great deal from the faithful in the diocese. So the council will help us move forward in, in addressing racism uh, and to uh, help to heal wounds and uh, maybe to uh, also, importantly, uh, put in some positive steps so uh, everyone in our community uh, feels as a welcomed and loved member uh, of our, our family. That's wonderful. I know you first announced this decision to form this advisory council back in August, and the Diocese of Arlington has undertaken a number of initiatives to address racism. Why do you personally feel it's so important, and how exactly does it support our Catholic faith? Our, our listening sessions uh, really impacted me a great deal. Uh, as I heard stories uh, of, of history and uh, of also recent past, and even in the present day, of individuals, uh, our brothers and sisters, talking about how they have been uh, part of racism, have they have been hurt by it, and have wounds that they're still trying to heal. And having listened to those stories, uh, I just thought it was a, a very important step uh, to bring together leaders, uh, 14 or so leaders of, of great expertise and background uh, to support the diocese in our implement implementation plan of addressing uh, racism. And it, as you said, it fits beautifully into our, our Catholic faith. Uh, it's a mandate of the gospel uh, that all persons are treated reverently and equally, and their dignity uh, of each person is upheld. So uh, it's really a response to the gospel itself. What would you say, or what have you said to people who may have been disheartened by injustices they see as motivated by racism? Well, I think it's important. I think this is where Pope Francis helps us uh, a great deal, where he tells us it's important, first of all, to acknowledge, to acknowledge that this has been a reality in history and in the present day in various forms, uh, to be attentive. Uh, I think Pope Francis talks to us about being attentive. So listen to the stories, as, as difficult as it may be. Be attentive. Listen listen to the stories. And that's what our, our sessions were able to do. And then accompany, right, to walk with people. If you're going to help people to heal wounds, you, you have to walk with them. You don't do it from a distance. That's why I don't want this uh, advisory council to come up with some sort of plan that's going to sit on a shelf. No, it's going to be an action. Uh, and, that's, and that's the other thing uh, that Pope Francis reminds us of. It's, it's not just words. We have to begin to act. And, and I believe the council will end up uh, giving us some very concrete, specific steps moving forward. I want to change things just for a minute, a little bit differently. Yesterday, you took part in the Red Mass at St. Matthew's Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and its purpose is to invoke God's blessings on those responsible for the administration of justice, as well as all public officials. I know one of the things that you talked about in the homily was the importance of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including wisdom, counsel, and strength. Can you talk about that as it relates to our elected officials and other public servants, especially in today's climate? 
Yes, I was very honored uh, to be invited to uh, be the homilist at the Red Mass and to address uh, you know, our distinguished justices and uh, judges and professors and students of the law. Uh, the Red Mass honors the sacred character of the law, and we also pray for its guardians. And uh, we mentioned at the Red Mass, and certainly within uh, my homily, uh, that, it, it, that our, there's a natural law written in the heart of every human person from which all human uh, laws must flow. And those in, in the uh, guardians of the law are, are to make sure that we are respectful of God's divine law. That's where all human laws flow from. And so we must be willing uh, to bring our, our faith uh, uh, into the public arena. We must be willing uh, to stand firm in our moral convictions uh, when applying justice. And we know that for any of us, as we try to live consistently our faith, uh, we should never try to rely on our own resources. Uh, we need God's help, the strength that God supplies, most especially uh, through the fulfillment of his promise that his spirit will be with us. And so I encouraged uh, those who were at the Red Mass yesterday and all your listeners, call upon those gifts that you need. Uh, and sometimes it's wisdom, sometimes it's courage, but ask God for those gifts. He promised to give it to you. And it will be those gifts from those gifts uh, that we will find the strength to be faithful. As St. Paul said uh, in the readings we used for Mass yesterday, so we could be faithful in living a manner worthy of the call we have received. Well, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Bishop Michael F. Burbage of the Diocese of Arlington. Thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. Now, dozens of new Swiss Guard recruits take the oath to protect Pope Francis and future popes. 38 of them marched into San Damaso Courtyard at the Vatican wearing the traditional colorful uniforms. The ceremony is usually held in May to mark the date back in 1527, 147 Swiss Guards died while protecting Pope Clement VII during the sack of Rome. Yesterday, Pope Francis told the new recruits that God always stands by their side. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.